Hi, I'm Phil Cook, and this is a little interesting podcast today from what we normally do. You know, I've always had a heart for helping people have a long, steady career. So often in the media business, and really in any career, you see flash in the pans, one-hit wonders, we call them in the music business. People who seem to really excel for a while, but then burn out. Somehow they fade, somehow they drop off the scene and off the radar. I've really been passionate for a long time about helping people understand how to have a long term career. So today, I want to bring you a talk I did for the O2 conference in the Midwest recently, and um, it really shares my sincere innermost thoughts about how to make that long-term career happen. I'd encourage you, stick with it today. Listen, because I think you're going to learn some things that will help you be in whatever career you've chosen. It'll help you be in it for the long haul. And ultimately, that's the way to make an impact. Very few people just go into some industry, some you know theme, some direction in their life and make a huge impact right away. Very often, it's that long, long, long haul that helps people make the ultimate career. So please call a friend pass this on, share it. Anybody that you know is struggling in their career, I think this would be a really great talk for them to hear. Me from the O2 conference in the Midwest just a couple years ago, I brought it back because I think it's going to really be something that, that can help you understand how to get from where you are to where you want to be. Second Timothy 4.7 three lines. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. I'm going to be a little different this morning because I want to talk a bit about finishing well. The reason is, as a media guy, as a communication guy, I've been startled, really shocked in the last few years at the number of ministry leaders that have not finished well and that are not finishing well. We've seen some of the largest churches in America some of the most respected Christian leaders who after a lifetime of doing stuff that I couldn't even imagine doing for God, amazing things, have dropped the ball. And I can't tell you, I can't, I, from working with a culture, I can tell you, you cannot overestimate the damage that causes the world's perception of who we are. I don't care how much you accomplish in your life, if you fail at the end, people think, see, I told you they were hypocrites. It's not real, they don't last, there's nothing there. And so I've been on a really obsessive thing about why this happens. Now, at the same time, there are people that fail not because of integrity or because of in character. They just struggle their whole life. I know people that are godly men and women who struggle their whole life in ministry. Now, what's interesting is at the same time, I started seeing a similar thing happening with friends of mine in Hollywood. I live in LA. We work with a lot of major movie studios and television networks. And I started noticing there were an enormous amount of people that do what I do out there, but they've done bigger projects than me. They've made a lot more money than me. They're much more significant and important than me, but today... They're struggling, and in some cases, they're not even in the industry at all. What happens to people when they struggle and work their whole life, and they have talent, they have gifts, but they don't make it to the finish line? Truth is, one out of every three biblical characters failed, did not finish well. And 2,000 years later, it's pretty much the same number nowadays. I'm shocked at the number of ministry leaders, pastors, and then people in my business that that fail. So I started on this passionate journey to figure out what's the difference between the guys that fail and the guys that have long, successful careers. And obviously, there's big picture things. There's big picture things like their closeness to the Lord, their prayer life, how much they, time they spend in the Bible. But I wanted to find practical, everyday stuff as well. And I started interviewing some interesting people. In Hollywood, I interviewed Dick Cook. Dick is, uh, started working at Disneyland driving the train. He retired two years ago as chairman of Walt Disney Studios. How's that for a rise in your career? I talked to Mark Zarati, who started in the business in the VHS cassette age. He ended up being president of Walt Disney Studios. Now he's the CEO of Cinemark Theaters. Talked to Ralph Winter, produced X-Men, Wolverine, Planet of the Apes, Star Trek. Last year he produced The Promise and Adrift. Been producing $200 million movies his whole career and is still going strong. And I wanted to talk to them to figure out what is it that makes the difference between those guys and so many that drop the ball. And while I was talking to them, I started noticing things that they do that's different than most of us. So get a pencil and paper out because I want to share with you what I found out. They're practical stuff. You'll, some of you may laugh. 
how insignificant this seems to be, but I found in every case, with every single long-term successful person I interviewed, these are the things that I discovered they all did. You ready? Number one, they were compelled to write things down. Now, this is interesting. Now, I'm not talking about meeting notes necessarily. They weren't documenting the meeting we were having, but I noticed that every time an idea would pop in their head, guess what? They would write it down. Now, I know this is important because I wake up in the middle of the night. I don't know about you, but I wake up in the middle of the night with genius ideas. And I think, no problem, I'll remember this in the morning, and I never do. How rich and famous would I be today if I'd written some of those things down? But I'd forgotten about it. One of the guys I interviewed was a businessman from South Africa. He said, um, he said, years ago when cell phones were just getting into their own, back in the flip phone days, he said, my wife wanted to go shopping one night. And he said, I hate shopping. So we went to the mall. I sat on a bench out in the middle of the mall while she went into a women's store to look at dresses. He said, I started watching teenagers use their cell phone. And he said, this idea popped into my mind. He said, what if they could download their favorite songs and use them as ringtones on their phone? He said, you know, I thought that was a pretty good idea, so I pulled a pen out of my pocket, I found a piece of paper, wrote it down, and put the note in my jacket at the moment she called me in to look at a dress. Said, so I got up, I went in the store to look at a dress, and I completely forgot about the idea. He said, five months went by. Went back to my closet, randomly put that jacket back on, reached in the pocket, and to my surprise, I pulled out that note. And I remembered the idea, I remember that night at the mall. He says, so I thought, I gotta make this happen. So he got the rights, he bought the rights to five songs, made a deal with the local cell phone company, and he said, two years later, I sold that company for almost $100 million. Wow. And that's what he said, but here's the thing, Phil, had I not written it down, I would have completely forgotten about that idea. Wow. Completely forgot. How many ideas, let me put it this way, what could God drop on you at a conference like this? at a church service, in a meeting, at home, studying the Bible. What could he drop on you that if you don't write it down, you'll forget about it? Let me tell you something. Ever since I met him, I carry two note-taking apps on my phone. I carry note cards and a little wallet in my back pocket. I even invented, some of you may have seen, I invented a thing called Unique. It's a, it's a print planner because I want to write that stuff. You can go to Amazon and buy it, by the way. UniqueCreativePlanner.com to help people develop their ideas and write it down. Start writing things down. Number two, I, de I learned that people who are successful over the long term default to action. In other words, they would rather make a wrong decision than make no decision at all. They're people that do stuff. They think about it, but they don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about it, and they're not afraid to make mistakes. I have a friend, David McFadzian, who invented a couple, he, he created a couple TV shows, Roseanne, the original Roseanne, the original Home Improvement. Then he went on to do movies, an extremely successful movie producer. And I was talking to him one day, and he said he gets his office flooded with screenplays. Young writers want him to evaluate their movie screenplays and want their, his opinion on them. He said, so about 10 years ago, I started this, this idea. He said, I always write them back, and I say, tell you what, if you're a professional writer, so send me 10 of your scripts, and you tell me which one you want me to evaluate, and I promise you, I'll send you a detailed evaluation of that script. He started doing that 10 years ago, and guess what? He's never had one single writer take him up on it. These are people that consider themselves writers, but they don't, have, don't even have 10 scripts to show for it. Let me tell you something. Whatever it is you do, you need to get out there and be doing it. You need to do it. I meet people all the time. Well, Phil, I want to write a book but I'm waiting to meet a publisher. You'll never write a book. I wanna make a movie, but I need to find the funding for it. They'll never make a movie. If you're waiting for something to happen instead of starting where you are, it will never, ever happen. Go where you are. I love in Gideon, when the angel came to Gideon, he said, go in the strength you have, which means go do it. Whatever you have with you, go do it. We don't default to action. As leaders, we need to make things happen. By the way, I, to, I told the group of pastors this morning at breakfast, they have two film festivals now for movies made on iPhones. And you're telling me you want to make a movie, but you're waiting to get financing? No, 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 no. Get out there and start making the movie. Get with it. Start a business in your garage. Whatever you have to do, do it. Number three, I discovered leaders that are long-term successes 
are willing to take the hits. They're willing to take the hits. They are willing to take responsibility. I met a guy at Starbucks the other day, tapped me on the shoulder, I was in line, and he said, hey, you're Phil Cook, right? I said, yeah. He said, man, I've read your books, I've heard you speak, I just want to introduce myself. I said, what do you do? He said, well, I'm a director, I'm a film director. And I was skeptical, in LA, everybody's a film director. So I said, what have you, what have you actually directed? And he named three movies that I'd seen. And I said, man, that's pretty incredible. What's going on? That's fantastic. He told me that he started as a TV commercial director, became one of the hot guys doing that in the world and did a film at Sundance that won some awards. And then he did three studio pictures. And I said, what project are you working on now? He paused for a second and said, well, I'm managing an apartment complex right now. I thought, whoa, how do you move from directing three major films to managing an apartment complex? And he started listing all the things that had gone wrong with his film career. The studio took advantage of him, the last film he made. His producer brought it in over budget. They spent too much money. His writer didn't deliver a good script. His, ain't, his agent didn't help him find great talent. And as he was listing all these things, I realized he's never gonna make another film in his career. Because never once did one of those things reflect a mistake he had made. He didn't own up to anything. He never once said, well, Phil, the truth is, I didn't make a great film. Truth is, I could have delivered something much better, but I didn't. Never once did he take responsibility for, for his mistakes. Let me tell you something. Until you own up to your bad ideas, you'll never get any good ideas anymore. We need to take responsibility. And let me tell you something even bigger. You need to take responsibility when you're taken advantage of and it's not even your fault. When mistakes happen and it's not even your fault. I met a ministry leader recently that, had hired a guy to run his ministry years ago. And the guy was terrible. He made some horrible mistakes that they're still paying for. And this ministry leader fired the guy, but he's still having to deal with the aftermath of all the mistakes that guy made. And I noticed something that when the media interviews him about it, he never once has thrown that guy under the bus. He always takes the hits. He always says, it was my fault. It was my mistake and we're gonna make it better. Never once does he blame anybody else. That guy's gonna do something remarkable with his life. My father, my father was, um, I, I know this intimately because my father was a pastor in Charlotte, North Carolina. We had a church there that I grew up in. And uh, in the late 60s, my dad started really exploring the Holy Spirit. You know, the, the Holy Spirit renewal was going on and, and he started exploring that and teaching on it. It was a Presbyterian church, so it was a little radical. And there was a couple elders that didn't like the direction my dad's preaching was going. So it took them two years of conniving behind the scenes, but they got my dad fired from the church. I went a thousand miles away to college and the first phone call I got from my parents was that they'd been fired from that church. Well, my dad went on and started another church and ended up at a couple more churches before he eventually retired. But here's the problem. He never got over those guys getting him fired. I would call him from college and say, Dad, what's going on? Say, you remember those guys that fired me? That's all he wanted to talk about. He would obsess on it. He would dwell on it. Years went by. Decades went by. In fact, when my sister called me about eight years ago, my dad was dying in the hospital. She called me, it's time to come home, come to see Dad. Flew in real quick, walked in his hospital room. He could barely speak, walked in his hospital room. The first thing he said was, remember those guys that got me fired 30 years ago? He obsessed on it his whole life. And let me tell you something. He never had a ministry bigger than the time that he had at that church. He never grew. He never had more impact. All because he couldn't let it go. Let me tell you something. You gotta let go of the lower rung to grab the higher rung on the ladder. Yes, Whatever's happened to you, I don't care how much you've been taken advantage of, learn to take it and move on with your life. And by the way, stop bl blaming God for your failures too. I, I, I was at a... I was, at a, I was speaking at a conference a couple years ago and very few people showed up. This guy, this, this pastor had created the conference and very people showed up and he said, you know, well, I just guess these are the people God wanted to be here. And I said, well, no, how about you really suck at marketing? How about you're not very good at promoting this? What about that? You know, we, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to use a bad word there, but... We blame God for stuff, subtly, but we blame God for that. No, we could do a better job. Stop that stuff. Take ownership and move on. All right, you with me? Number four, leaders that last a long time are ruthless about their time. Ruthless about their time. Dreaming is great, but doing is what creates influence. These people that, you know, 
years ago, I had an assistant come into my office one day because I love helping people. I love talking about people's career and helping them and I'll chat with anybody about it. And my assistant came into my office one day and she said, you know, I've been tracking your time for the last two months. She said, you spend more time helping other people with their career than you do helping our company. She said, if we keep doing this, we will be out of business in a year. And it made me, it woke me up and made me realize, sure, I like to help people, but I better get my priorities in order. And we built a fence around my time. You can't just call me up anymore. You can't expect to get a response from me anymore. It's not about being a jerk. It's just about realizing that if God's called you to accomplish something significant in your life, you've got to say no to stuff. You've got to focus. You've got to focus. And we're Christians, particularly Christian leaders. We think, oh yeah, I've got to take every call. I've got to take every appointment. I've got to meet everybody that wants to meet. No, you don't. No, you don't. You can be gracious. You don't have to be a jerk. But valuing, and by the way, uh, Warren Buffett, a big part of this, Warren Buffett, the great investor, said one of my favorite quotes of all time. He said, the difference between successful people and really successful people is really successful people say no most of the time. Because really successful people know what their priorities are. Again, you don't have to be a jerk, but just understand what God's called you to accomplish, and you're going to have to say no to some things. And by the way, saying no can change your life. I, I, had a, I did a music video back in the millennium. Remember in the year 2000? On, on, on New Year's Eve of the millennium, a television network had asked me to produce a TV special that was kind of looking back over the last thousand years. And we shot music. It was a musical special. And we went all over the world shooting artists, doing some stuff. And right then, Michael Crawford was at his peak of fame doing Phantom of the Opera on Broadway. So... I got Michael Crawford to come and shoot a song. We we're going to do it in a studio in Los Angeles. We built a set that was like a burned out cathedral, it was nighttime. It was very dramatic, really cool. It was going to be amazing. Well, two weeks before we shot, his agent called me. He said, you know, I have to tell you, I'm not really happy with where the studio is located. He said, I'm not happy with what time you want to shoot, Michael. I just, I'm just not really happy about a lot of this stuff. And I panicked and I thought, oh my gosh, what can I do? And so I started saying, well, how can I help? We talked for a while, and lo and behold, the next day he called me, and he wasn't happy with something else. The next day he called me, he wasn't happy with something else. Literally for a week, every single day he called me complaining about some aspect of what I was going to do on the shoot with Michael. Finally, I don't know if it was the Lord or what, but I, this, this thought came into my mind that, you know what, maybe this is not going to work. And the next day the agent called me, I said, well, you know what, if you're not happy, Michael's not going to be happy. If Michael's not going to be happy, he's not going to do a good job. The network's not going to like it. So why don't we just pull the plug? I said, this show is going to air globally on the eve of the millennium. I got plenty of artists that, wanna, that would love a shot at that. Why don't we just say no and just, just stop? And there's a long pause. And the guy said, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, I was just trying to help. You, you, don't, you didn't understand. And from that moment, he rolled over and became a puppy. He could not do enough to help me. Everything was great with him all of a sudden. In fact, he showed up on the day of the shoot just to bring me coffee. And I learned at that moment the power of no can clarify your life in ways you never imagined. Never imagined. Remember, Jesus walked away from certain villages and towns that would not respond to him. There's a time when God's called us to something higher and we need to say no. And by the way, I, I, I get people, I used to get people calling me all the time saying, Phil, I'd love to come and pick your brain. I'd just love to come over and sit and talk. And they just want to plop down on my sofa and talk for like four hours and not pay me anything, of course. And so I was just talking about it one day because I'm thinking, I got to work doing what we do and I don't have time for all this. And my, my, my daughter, Kelsey, was working with us at the time and she said, Dad, I'll take care of this. Let me take care of it. Okay. So people would call, and Kelsey would take the call, and they'd say, you know, I'd love to come over and just pick, pick Phil's brain, talk to him about some things in my career and what I should do. And she said, that's awesome. That's great. In fact, Phil loves to do that so much, he's blocked a couple days every week just for people to come and pick his brain. And it starts at $350 an hour. Let me know when I can set, schedule that for you. She said, Dad, it's interesting. 80% of the calls never called again. But 20% said, that's awesome. When can I sign up? Let me do it. I started making money off saying no to people. You can be creative and do this. You can be creative and do this. Be ruthless about your time. Let me tell you, if you're a ministry leader, God's called you to do something in your community that's significant. Value that. Don't blow that time away. Number five, this is a weird one I discovered. Every person I interviewed without fail 
he had virtually stopped making decisions. Now, let me explain. Obviously, we have to make decisions. In fact, I read a study two weeks ago that said that the average adult in America makes 35,000 decisions a day. Think about it. From the moment you get up, what do I wear? What do I eat? Where do I go? What do I do? All day long, we're making decisions. In fact, psychologists have coined a term now. They have a clinical term called decision fatigue from simply the overwhelming need to make so many decisions. And we're discovering that burnout, remember pastor burnout? All, all this, my whole lifetime, we've thought it was certain things. Now psychologists are starting to think a big part of it is decision, decision fatigue. They're making decisions over all kinds of stuff. And it literally wears us out. What I've discovered about these amazing leaders is they've just cut back on the decisions they have to make. For instance, obviously they delegate things whenever they can. They develop a team around them that's good. But more important, they've discovered that most of the stuff we make decisions about during a day, we don't really make, need to make decisions about. I think it was Peter Drucker, the management consultant, that said the worst thing you could possibly do is make a great decision about something that doesn't matter. You're wasting your time. In fact, what I discovered in every single one of these leaders, most of their email responses are three or four words. That's it. That's it. They don't spend a lot of time crafting two-page emails. They get it done and move on. Think, when you go back home, think about all the decisions you make in a day. How could I streamline that? How could I cut that down? How could I delegate some things? How could I just ignore some things? Two years ago, I had a, some computer glitch. 60 emails in my inbox disappeared. And I panicked, man, I panicked. I got some big churches that we work with. I was totally panicked. Guess what? Nothing happened. Nothing happened. I'm thinking about once a month just deleting my inbox. It's amazing when you think about the decisions you make that really don't matter. Stop decision fatigue. Number six. By the way, here's the other thing about decision fatigue. You know, in the old days, we'd go to the shoe store and buy shoes. I'd get a size 10, maybe brown loafers. They had, what, five pairs to pick from? Now I go on Amazon, and there's 50,000 pairs I have to pick from. We live in this world where we make more decisions than we think. I wanted a watch band the other day, and I went on Amazon, and I just panicked. I mean, there were so many, I just didn't, I didn't buy. There's a, there's a famous study out there, by the way, when you give people too many choices, they don't buy anything. So, decision fatigue, it really doesn't matter. Number six, discover your one big thing. Years ago, I wrote a book called One Big Thing, Discovering What You Were Born to Do. And I discovered, oddly enough, that these leaders, long-term leaders, have really figured out what they're wired to do and are in that niche full bore. The bottom line is, to make an, inf make an impact as a leader, most great leaders are not pretty good at a lot of stuff. They're amazing at one big thing. Sure, they know a lot of things, but the truth is they figured out what that one thing is and they pursue it with a passion. And I tell you, if you want to get on the radar as a pastor or ministry leader, that's incredibly important. I'll give you an example. In a world where people are bombarded with 5,000 media messages a day, people are desperate to find an easy hook to think about you in. For instance, Joel Osteen, whatever you think about Joel, he's the hope guy. What do you think about Oral Roberts? He was the healing guy. Billy Graham's the salvation guy. People have figured out how to put them in this little narrow niche, and it's transformed their career. You know the woman who has the most Grammy Awards in history? By far, most Grammy Awards in history is not Celine Dion or Aretha Franklin or Beyonce. Barbara Streisand, the woman with most Grammy Awards in history is Alison Krauss, the bluegrass player. You know why? I don't care what happens at the Emmy Awards or Grammy Awards, but when they announce the bluegrass awards, she dominates. She rocks that category and she walks away with eight or 10 of them every year, every year. She's got something like 30 or 40 more than the next place person in history of Grammys because she owns her niche. My pastor for many, many years was Jack Hayford in LA. We raised our daughters in Jack's church until he retired. And I've heard Jack preach probably six or 800 sermons. But if you cut Jack, he will bleed worship. He lives for worship. He's written five books on worship. He's written 100 worship songs. In the 20-some years we went to Jack's church, he led the worship. He didn't just preach. He was our worship leader. 
which means I don't care what he preaches on. Forgiveness, prophecy, finances, family issues, whatever it is, he does it through the lens of worship. You wonder what put Jack on the map? That's what put Jack on the map. You figure out what that lens is for you. What's the thing, if I held a gun to your head and said you could only preach on one thing for the rest of your life, what would it be? What's that thing you're watching? And by the way, I'm not big on passion. I have so many people come to me, Phil, I'm so passionate about this. I'm passionate about that. (laughs) People send me screenplays. Phil, would you read my screenplay? I'm so passionate about writing. Yeah, but you stink at it. You're terrible. (laughs) Let me tell you, it's not about passion. It's about figuring out what you are wired to do. What did God put you on the earth to accomplish? I'll guarantee you, once you figure that out, you'll get passionate about it really quick because you'll see results. You'll really see results. I wanted to be a director. I went to Oral Roberts University way long time ago. Studied film and television. I wanted to direct film so badly. And I've directed in probably 60 countries around the world. I've directed all kinds of projects. But I was doing a short film in Vancouver about 15 or 20 years ago, and I hit a wall. I realized in one moment that I could not get my actors to do what I wanted them to do, and it was because I did not have the vocabulary. I did not know how to get them there. And I realized, I had this revelation that I'm not going to be able to go. I don't have the tools, the wiring, the skill to go to the level I want as a director. And I sat back for a moment, and I thought, but wait a second, writing, I've written my whole life. Produced, I've produced more than most people have ever produced in a lifetime. I should be writing and producing. That's what I should do. What if I'd had that revelation when I was 21? How far would my career have gone? But I wasted 20 years of my career because I was passionate about directing. I've got 150 books in my library on directing. I studied the great directors. But it was a waste ultimately because it wasn't what I was truly wired to do. You figure out that. And it'll transform where you're going. And the last thing I would tell you is, number seven, understand the power of your story. And this is far more significant than you think. I I believe that your story matters and how you integrate that story into your work is gonna be the key to you having a breakthrough. I told the pastors this morning at breakfast that when I worked for Oral Roberts a long time ago, you know, Oral was healed of tuberculosis. Some of you know his story as a teenager, he was healed of tuberculosis, and uh, his sister Jewel literally picked him up and hand carried him to an ev- a traveling evangelist who was praying for the sick. And God dramatically healed him. And he was, I mean, he was almost at the point of death, throwing up blood like crazy. His parents were changing his wallpaper every week. It was a horrible, but God healed him. Years later, when I was directing his television programs, Oral talked about God healing him over and over, over and over. I got so sick of hearing about. God healing Oral Roberts. I finally actually pulled him aside one day and said, Oral, give it a rest. People are sick of hearing that story. And it wasn't for years later that I realized what a moron I was because hearing about how God healed him gave other people the courage to believe God could heal them. It was that connecting point that made his ministry success. Uh, Comic books are the same way. You know, any of you that collect comic books, the most valuable collector's comic books of all time. Guess what? They're origin stories. How Batman got started, how Iron Man got started, how Spider-Man got started. That's what people value because people love to hear your story. How did you get saved? How did you grow up? How did God transform your life? You can never stop telling that story because people connect to you because that gives them a point to relate to. Does that make sense at all? And I'm going to tell you something. I'm not telling you anything new, but just remember... God was willing to sacrifice his son to win your story back. He values your story that much, and yet we go through our work every day, never once thinking about how our story fits into what we do. We preach, but we don't really tell much about us. Joyce Meyer is brilliant at this. I mean, she tells her story all the time, even mundane, stupid stories about how God convicted her of taking her grocery cart back to the rack after loading her groceries in the car. But people love that. Because it connects her to them. Your story matters more than you think. I'll, be, I'll speak to a group like this and at least a third of the people will say, but Phil, nothing happened to me in my life. I'm not dramatic. Nothing big happened. Nobody cares. Trust me, there's somebody that needs to hear your story out there. Somebody needs to hear your story. And you never know the impact it can make. And I'll finish with a story and, and be done. Uh, I, I, I've, 
I'm working television, radio, film, all kind of social media, and it's very hard to track the impact you make there. Obviously, you can get response in some ways, but it's always been very hard, and I've always been fascinated at, you know, what happens when I put that show out there, when I throw that movie out there, we do a social media campaign, a commercial, whatever. What happens out there? I was in Africa years ago filming a crusade, big evangelistic event in South Africa, and I met a guy named Nicholas Bingu. Time Magazine called him the Billy Graham of Africa because he had led more Africans to Christ than any man in history. He was an African himself, great preacher, and he'd led more, think about that, he'd led more Africans to Christ than any man in history. Back then, he was in his late 70s. He's passed away since, but he was in his late 70s, so I got to interview him. So I set up my camera and lights, set him down in a chair, and I said, you know, Nicholas, tell me about this. You've led more Africans to Christ than any man in history. What is that like? And he was a really humble guy. And he said, let me tell you a different story. He said, many, many years ago, he said, long ago, he said, a young couple came over to Africa to be missionaries. And he said, they were really excited. Their denomination had sent them over. They were all pumped up and ready to go. He said, the problem was, apparently, they just weren't very good at it. He said, they'd preach. Nobody came forward. Nobody responded. And they, were, they, they would work hard at it. They would travel around. They would preach. Not one single convert. And they'd have to come back for, you know, furlough to raise money for their mission work. Can you imagine trying to raise money for work and you not have one single conversion to talk about? Not one. But they were faithful. And so they'd go back to Africa and they struggled. They built a church nobody came to. Years and years and years went by. In fact, the, he said the only African they even came in contact with really was a little kid who helped them with their gear and their equipment. But not one conversion, not one single conversion. So finally, after decades of doing this, in utter, complete failure, the, the denominational leader said, this is kind of a joke. These guys are terrible at this. What, we made a huge mistake. We need to call them back. So after spending their entire adult life as missionaries without one single success story, they were called back to the U.S. And he said back in those days, they traveled by boat. And even after all those years, the only person to even see him off was that little kid helping him with their gear. They came back to the U.S. They retired from ministry, absolutely hum humiliated, shamed, embarrassed. And because they were so crushed by their failure, it wasn't but a couple years before they died. That's when Nicholas looked at me and said, you know, Phil, what they didn't know was I was that little kid. He said, God didn't send them over to reach 1,000 people or 100 people or 10 people. God sent them over there to reach me. And since that time, I've led more Africans to Christ than any man in history. Wow. Let me tell you something. You never know. I don't, don't tell me you're frustrated because you have 25 people in your church. Don't tell me you're frustrated because you have five people in your church. You never know what one of those people could go out and do for God. You just never ever know. I can't emphasize enough that people that make the greatest impact are often the people that have the longest career. People that stay on that tra trajectory for a really long time. They have a vision and they stick to it, but so often in today's distracted, disrupted world, we literally get sidetracked so many ways and, in, and so often that it's hard to maintain that long career. So I encourage you, if you know somebody struggling in their career, send them this episode. I think it will really, really help them understand what it takes to get from where they are to where they want to be. And remember, give us a rating, give us some comments, come on and share this. It helps us go up. It helps more people see it. When you rate us, when you comment, I would really appreciate you doing that. And don't forget my book, Maximize Your Influence. I think if you're concerned about how digital media can help get your story out, your message, your vision out as a leader, this is the book for you. Maximize Your Influence. You can get it at influencematters.com. You can get it on amazon.com, whatever's convenient for you. I'd encourage you to get your hands on the book because it can make a real difference. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you at the next episode.